Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center. This is the show for Monday, February 19th, 2024. Hope you had an awesome weekend. Thank you for kicking off your week with me here today, whether it's your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. I can't thank you enough. Today, I'm covering the second and third anti-federalist letters from a federal farmer. Now, in his first letter, which I covered uh, maybe a week and a half ago in an episode, Beware of Tyrants, Anti-Federalist, Federal Farmer Number 1, he warned against adopting a new system quickly out of fear of an emergency situation, which he said has always been, quote, the custom of tyrants and their dependents. So he's like, hey, let's slow down because it's only the tyrants who want to rush us into a new thing because we're afraid of what might happen if we don't get there. And what do tyrants love more than anything? Well, to <laughs> most of the founding generation, especially the anti-federalist side, they love power centralized and consolidated in the fewest hands possible. And in his first paper, again, he did warn that in an eventual consolidation wasn't just likely a centralization. It wasn't going to end up as a federal system, even if it looked like that on paper. He said, overall, he said it was a plan to make it that way in the long run. He said the plan proposed appears to be partly federal, but principally, however, calculated ultimately to make the states one consolidated government. So he thought that over time, uh, especially terms that were in uh, not uh, indefinite, we'll say, uh, led to unlimited indefinite powers because people with power would always try to read things in a way that expanded their own power. And here from T.J. Martinelli said the federal farmer wasn't only concerned about the federal government undermining the states and the power reserved to the states. He worried that it would swallow up the power of the people themselves as well. And here he kicked off his second letter on October 9th, 1787. These are to uh, the Republican. We think it's uh, Governor Clinton in New York, but we don't know for sure. We don't know who authored it. Maybe it was Melanchthon Smith. Maybe it was John Williams. Maybe it was a partnership with Richard Henry Lee. We have no idea. But anyways, here's how he kicked off second, his second letter. The essential parts of a free and good government are a full and equal... <laughs> Now, maybe such a thing doesn't exist, but we can set that aside. The essential parts of a free and good government are a full and equal representation of the people in the legislature. Having the people properly represented was an essential part of the anti-federalist argument. They were saying, well, if you don't actually represent the interests of the people, you only represent small portions of the people, or you don't have enough representatives to properly do that, then it's impossible to have anything other than a consolidated government dictating to the people of the several states. And that's how he kicks off his second argument. Maybe it really came from the federal farmer. Maybe it was a combination of people. But this was a very prominent argument. So he wants to have an equal representation of the people in the legislature and the jury trial and the vicinage and the administration of justice, a full and equal representation in that which present possesses the same interests, feelings, opinions, and views, the people themselves would were they all assembled. So the idea, <laughs> the short version, the TLDR is you have to have a, like, if there's 20% of this type of person and 10% of this type, of, of course, it's not focused on the individual. It's impossible to have everyone represented, represented in a government. And they all recognize that, but they wanted to get as close as possible. And that's what a uh, federal farmer is getting at here. He said, a fair represent representation, therefore, should be so regulated that every order of men in the community, according to the common course of elections, can have a share in it in order to allow professionals, merchants, traders, farmers, mechanics, etc., to have a voice in that government. He said the representation, therefore, must be considerably numerous. It must be very numerous. And he did not like the number of representatives that they were proposing. And this is a very similar take to what the anti-federalist Brutus made in his fourth essay the following month. He made the case that the Federal House of Representatives could never be truly representative. It was impossible. It's not possible to represent the people in this type of a situation because there are far too few members. He predicted that this would be, lead to corruption and bribery. And rather than having a free government, it would lead to one of consolidation, force, and coercion. And we're going to hear a little bit about how Federal Farmer made that same case as well 
uh, a little bit later here in this episode. But I covered Brutus's fourth paper and his whole series of them. You'll find this one linked to in the show notes over at TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash Path to Liberty. And on the bottom of that show page, you'll see all the various uh, series that I've been doing on the Anti-Federalists. I've got Brutus, Cato, Patrick Henry speeches. Now we're doing a federal farmer. I'll probably cover, cover Sentinel and Old Whig uh, because... They don't get enough attention when we're talking about the original legal meaning of the Constitution. If you only listen to one side, a lot of times, even when you're reading the Federalist, for example, and I often point out that the Federalist is overhyped, but many times in the Federalist, they're specifically responding to arguments made by anti-Federalists. And if you don't understand the context of what they're arguing, then, well, you, you're led to other stuff. Anyways, here's Jason Mandrish over at the founder of the day, he said, Federal Farmer begins his piece by pointing out that at the time, the separate states had about 200 state senators and implementing the Constitution would reduce this number to 26. He said, well, I mean, even this idea of equal representation in the Senate, he wasn't a fan of, especially because the number was so low. And if they were going to make decisions on all these kinds of things, they weren't going to be. Now, we know that this was supposed to be representative of each state, but he still did not like this approach because the number was too low. You can't properly represent the interests of a state with just two dudes. That's impossible. There's so many different viewpoints. And that gets to the idea we can keep going on this. The logical conclusion is that it is impossible to have actual representation. And maybe that's why the founders generally refer to these people as rulers rather than representatives. But he said the people, and this is from Jason again, the people would be still further removed from control of the government based on physical distance. So this is kind of an inside the beltway versus the rest of the country approach. And we see much of this today. It's the most influential people are living surrounding Washington, D.C., Anyways, here back to Federal Farmer in his second paper. He said, if it were possible to consolidate the states and preserve the features of a free government, still it is evident that the middle states, the part of the union, about the seat of government, would enjoy great advantages, while the remote states would experience the many inconveniences of remote provinces. So his idea was even if it was possible to have all power centralized into one place, a study of history, and of course he was like so many other in the founding generation, the average people were historians. We don't know who this author is, but this is a, clearly a, a person who is well-versed in history, and you can see that throughout the papers. But he certainly understood that all centralized states throughout history, the people at the uh, center got all the advantages and at the margins were kind of left to rot in some ways. He said wealth, offices, and the benefits of government would collect in the center, and the extreme states and their principal towns become much less important. And maybe in a weird way, that's kind of how I think. I mean, people are like, why do you live in California? Well, I'm as far away from the center of power as can be. I mean, there certainly is a lot of cultural influence that comes out of this state, a political influence that I don't like. Uh, but I'm certainly as far away from Washington, D.C., just about as I can get. But he goes a little further. He said, yet they must be executed on the principles of fear and force in the extremes. In order to get people on board, the more centralized the power is, and this is just what Cato and Brutus were saying in, the, in future episodes as well. Basically, if you have a centralized power, the people that are not on board with that, they have to be ruled through fear and and force. And certainly we see that playing out every day, today, all the time, whatever the issues, whether it's health or foreign or domestic policy, if they don't enact this thing, if they don't get more power to do this, you're going to have millions of people dying in the streets. How many times have we heard this over and over and over? And as long as the people succumb to that fear, then they're not going to use the force. But uh, of course, they also have the force as well, and they do use it quite a bit. He said, this has been the case with every extensive republic of which we have any accurate account. So as a student of history, the federal farmer is pointing out that uh, a consolidated centralized power will always eventually rule through fear and force in the extremes. This has been the case with every extensive republic we've ever looked at. And again, this is the same type of message that other anti-federalists took. And I don't know for sure if federal farmer influenced their writing, but if that's the case, this might be one of the most influential anti-federalist writers. I often talk about how the federalist papers are given an outsized influence today. They did not have much influence on the ratification debates. They were primarily 
written for a New York audience to convince it's every one of the Federalist Papers starts out to the people of New York. So they're writing to the people of New York, encouraging the ratification convention there to actually support ratification. And they didn't have much influence in the other state ratifying debates. James Wilson's State House Yard speech is one of the most influential uh, Federalist uh, publications. It was reprinted all over the place. And you can see how that October 6, 1787 speech by James Wilson, you see how many of the Federalists followed with very similar arguments uh, and they built upon it from there as well. So he was one of the leading guys and many of the anti-Federalists, they argue back and forth with Mr. Wilson specifically in their articles. Now, maybe the same can be said for Federal Farmer. I'm not certain. But again, Cato number three had this same kind of approach, and this was just weeks after the Federal Farmer's second essay that we're covering right now. He said a consolidated government would never be able to properly represent the views of people in different states. Again, the fewer the people have power, the less you are actually representing the people at large. And it would only result in an institution based on, well, force, fear and force is always the recurring theme. I will link to that episode as well in the show notes. 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. Here's Tara Ross. She said, how can such a kind of putting this into place? How can such a diverse country as America? And if you think about it today, the wide range of political, economic, social, religious viewpoints all live together in peace. Well, if you have a one size fits all solution, the more centralized the government, the more you're going to have infighting. We live under the largest government in the history of the world. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's all kinds of infighting. Every single issue is a national debate. Every single local thing is a national debate about how these people are bad and these people are good and blah, blah, blah. And it ends up being people fighting to the death almost, trying to control the entire system. That's what it ends up in. Violence, force, and fear. And she's asking this same question in, uh, in her research on Federal Farmer, these blogs. How can such a diverse country as America hope to remain free with one size fits all laws in place? In the words of Federal Farmer, quote, if a people be so situated or have such different opinions that they cannot agree in ascertaining and fixing them, it is a very strong argument against their attempting to form one entire society, to live under one system of laws only. And that's why the people who advocated for the system, and we know that Federal Farmer, his preferred system, was actually what they were claiming the Constitution was going to be. I covered that in the episode a couple of weeks ago on his first essay, he specifically said there are three options. Either we can have a totally decentralized system, we can have a totally consolidated centralized system, or we have kind of a mixed one where they get general delegated powers and all the important stuff are reserved to the people. Now, that's how James Madison described things in Federalist 45. He said the powers delegated to the, by the proposed constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those reserved to the states and the people are numerous and indefinite. And that's the type of system that the federal farmer wanted. He's really just taking the position that what they're claiming it's going to be, it's not going to play out that way. And his view, again, as I mentioned right at the beginning here and in last episode, was that he thought that even though they weren't all doing this, he thought that some were actually undermining, trying to create a system that would end up that way without actually saying it directly. And we know that's probably Hamilton. Anyways, back to the federal farmer. He said they proposed to lodge in the general government very extensive powers. Powers nearly, if not altogether, complete and unlimited over the purse and the sword. And everyone from John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution way back uh, in the 1760s to Patrick Henry in the Virginia ratification debates in 1788, well after this, kept reiterating this idea that if they have the power over the purse and the sword, this is the definition of a despotism. One of the ways that you can define tyranny, because even if they use the purse and the sword in ways that advance liberty today, eventually someone is going to have that power in the future. The issue being power. Once you have a lot of power, the bad guys are drawn to use, drawn to offices where they can use that power. And of course, the worst of the worst generally rise to the cr top of the uh, crust these days. Federal Farmer continues, he said, in examining the proposed constitution carefully, we must clearly perceive an unnatural separation of these powers over the purse and the sword 
from the substantial representation of the people. Tie it into, they have too few people, so they're not really representing. The vast majority of the people aren't being represented. If you got two uh, uh, elite dudes, uh, man, woman, whatever, in the Senate, these are the powerful people representing specific interests. Well, what about the rest of them for this state? They're not being represented. So it's only a couple of people for each state, a small handful of people that are in control over the uh, uh, the purse and the sword. And this is a very terrible situation to the federal farmer. He said, and therefore, unless the people shall make some great exertions to restore to the state governments their powers in matters of internal police, as the powers to lay and collect exclusively internal taxes, to govern the militia, and to hold the decisions of their own judicial courts upon their own laws final, the balance cannot possibly continue long, but the state governments must be annihilated or continue to exist for no purpose. The short version is he's kind of describing what we live under today. Because, well, he's really making four main points over what he is concerned with about potential consolidation. And even though, again, it may look like a federal republic on paper, he's taking the position that, well, over time, that power is going to keep growing. And unless we deal with these four things... This is a centralized tyranny. And he said to maintain a federal system rather than that centralized tyranny, you need a few things. One, state level control over their internal police. So the federal government should have no say, no involvement over local policing. And they have all kinds of that, whether it's through grants or federal court cases or federal programs, joint task forces where local law enforcement, for example, partners with the federal government, the DEA, the ATF, the DOJ, the FBI, all these. There's hundreds of these joint task forces. And in essence, well, not even in essence, technically in law, soon as they partner, soon as a local law enforcement uh, agent partners or is uh, a member of a federal state joint task force, while they are working on that task force, even if they're being paid by the state, they are actually a federal agent and they are not held to the laws of the state. They just have to follow the feds. Now, some people might think, well, okay, great. That means I shall not be infringed. But the feds don't actually believe in any of these things. They don't follow any of the Constitution. So when you're working with the feds in many situations, even when the states do something better than what the feds want them to do, they're downgraded when they're working on these state federal task forces. So this total control in many ways uh, over internal police. So state control over internal policing There can be no internal taxation from the federal government. And that's, well, that's obviously been thrown out the window. It was thrown out the window within just a few years. Total control of the states over the militia. Of course, we're trying to see some resurgence in that control with the Defend the Guard Act. And then, of course, the final say of state courts. So if the state courts make a decision about a state law, there is supposed to be no appeal to a federal court to overturn that. That gives superiority in the law over the state laws uh, to the federal government. And the federal farmer didn't want any of that. Now, as I mentioned a couple of times, and I do all the time, all the stuff that I'm covering in this episode, the original source documents, so Federal Farmer number two, and I'll get to number three here in just a moment, uh, some blog posts and articles from Tara Ross, Jason Mandrish at Founder of the Day, who has an awesome site, uh, and of course, TJ Martinell over here at TAC. These will all be over linked over in the show notes over at 10th Amendment Center.com slash Path to Liberty. Alan Mosley, Uh, Super consistent, super awesome, super grateful for his regular work in organizing these blog posts. Basically, I give him my show notes document. I give him some post-processed files, and he gets them all posted and uploaded everywhere that it needs to be so I can organize that and schedule and queue the publication of the blog post a couple hours after the live stream is done. You'll see that over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And while I'm here, a quick moment to say hello to everyone out in the live chat. I appreciate you being here. There's Garrett and Senator DT, Kirk Morrison. C&T Designs and Arms, awesome. Howard Clegg, Too Tall, Cheriton Farmer, Haji... Um, see who else is here. I'm seeing a few people back and forth. There's Eamon, Eamon, NJ Breen, Melody Skamen, 
Mr. Boston and everyone else. Thank you so much for being here again, and I hope you're enjoying the show so far. But let's get right back to it. Here's TJ Martinell again. So we're talking about this idea that they have too much power, internal control over internal taxes. And mind you, what they had for internal taxation at the time was very small compared to, well, what we've had since 1913 and even before then as well. But TJ said uh, the federal farmer continued the same line of reasoning in his third letter dated October 10th, 1787. So the very next day, he's got another one. Here he explained why the federal government would assume so much power that it would render the state governments meaningless. So he just, again, I think that quote from the first letter where he's like, it may look federal on paper. And in fact, he said this is the type of system that he preferred. Some delegated powers, limited enumerated delegated powers, everything else reserved to the people of the several states. That was the structure that he preserved. But he thought that the way that they actually put it together would over time give the central government so much power that over time, of the states would be essentially meaningless. We're very close to that today, not totally, but we do live under the largest government in history, so that is a lot of power assumed by the federal government. It's nowhere close to few and defined, as James Madison described it in Federalist 45. Uh, TJ continues, while not opposed to delegating more power to the federal government, again, we have to be clear, most of the anti-federalists were not just saying we got to keep the Articles of Confederation. Uh, most of them were just saying, we can hold on to this for the time being. Let's slow down. Let's think about some things and be very slow about the process. Some of them said, we don't want a new document. We want to see amendments under the amendment process to the Articles of Confederation. And some people said, yeah, OK, let's go with this new system, but you're doing too much. So he actually was on board with some changes. He actually, I think, was... Maybe OK with uh, coming up with a new constitution. He wasn't happy with the fact that they were expecting amendments and it was like a surprise attack. But he's like, well, it is what it is. Let's debate what's going on here now. So while not opposed to delegating more power to the federal government, TJ writes, the federal fa farmer felt the list of pro powers in the proposed constitution went much too far. And here he is saying many powers that respect internal objects ought clearly to be lodged in it as those to regulate trade between the states. Weights and measures, the coin or current monies, post offices, naturalization, not immigration, and etc. So he's saying certain powers should be delegated to the federal government, but not too much. He said these powers may be exercised without essentially affecting the internal police of the respective states. Again, the internal police, the police powers, basically control over the lives, liberty, and property of the people as the people determine in each state. So it could be very different in how that is in each state. In fact, we need more of that today, especially when we have so many statist pigs surrounding us left and right. Do your statist garbage over there. At least give us an option over here. And this is kind of, I think, the mentality and the approach of the people who I love over at the Free State Project, freestateproject.org, FSP. They certainly are saying, let's get like-minded people to move to a small geographic area and see how much we can influence. And you can see how people that are, A, involved in the political process and people, B, who are into things like agorism, all work together for the same goal, which is reduce the power of government and advanced liberty. So we see some positive things happening there, although they're still scratching the surface, but I love the idea there. So going further, he said, but powers to lay and collect internal taxes. This is a huge thing. And I'll get to this in a little bit more in just a moment. The power to lay and collect taxes to uh, internal taxes, to form the militia, to make bankrupt laws and to decide on appeals, questions arising on the internal laws of the respective states. We see this all the time. OK, under the incorporation doctrine, everything is a federal issue. It doesn't matter what the states are. Of course, everyone wants to point to some ways that the federal court system has advanced their view. But the federal court system for everyone that they've advanced that you like, they've probably advanced five or ten of your opposition. But he's saying, like, look, a state court decision, a Supreme Court is supreme on state laws. He didn't want the federal government involved in that. He felt that would leave lead to, over time, centralized power and a total tyranny. And maybe we need to look at how that connection came to play over time in another episode. He said, these will are of a very serious nature and carry with them almost all other powers. These just few things, internal police, internal taxation, control of the militia, and final say of state courts. 
if the federal government gets involved in these things, this leads to total, almost unlimited power. According to the federal farmer, we have all four of those today. He said these taken in connection with the other powers and powers to raise armies and build navies. Again, they're going to use centralization of power, fear and force. He did not like that uh, control over the militia in some way, not total control, but even some at all. He didn't want them to have any say over the militia at all. For these powers, in conjunction with powers to raise armies and build navies, proposed to be lodged in this government, appear to me to comprehend all the essential powers in the community. And those which will be left to the states will be of no great importance. Now, Jason Mandras again notes that he hits on this issue of representation again in his third paper. He's tying this all together again, because the fewer the people that are making the decisions, the less representation you actually have. And then, of course, the more tyranny you eventually have over time. He notes that should the Constitution be ratified, the House of Representatives would need only 33 people to form a quorum and questions how such a small number could claim to understand, quote, the opinions of three or four millions of people. So he say, like, you can get a quorum in the House, and that means 33 people are making decisions for three to four million. Can you imagine how he'd feel about 435 people making the decisions for 300, 320 million people, whatever the number is, but for a few hundred million, just 435 people, this is even close to representation, not anything whatsoever. So back to Jason Mandris, Mandrish, he said, the federal farmer goes on to report that, quote, the power of making any law will be in the president, eight senators, and 17 representatives, because if you have 33 people that make a quorum, ultimately 17 out of those 33 can make law for 3 million people. So 17, uh, 17 representatives, eight senators and one president. My math is terrible. I went to a government run school, so I was abused. So there is uh, eight, nine, 17, 20, 26 people, 26 people making decisions for three to four million people. Now, what's the total today? 435. Oh, man, I'm going to have to use a calculator. So 218 plus, we'll say 26 plus one. So 245 people can make law dictate to 300 plus million people. If that is not a consolidated empire, I don't know what is. And that's how Jason Mandras kind of gets into this. He said, while these numbers only apply to the inaugural government, the greater point is that only a very small number of people will be in charge of laying taxes on the whole of the United States. Additionally, it is that same number that will enforce policy with a standing army. And maybe they're not using the professional standing army today, but certainly so many of these federal agencies that could shouldn't exist under the Constitution, the ATF, FDA, DEA, and many others, they are armed to the teeth. And they're happy to enforce their will, even if it doesn't agree with what well, the legislature just lets them choose what they want to do. And so do the federal courts. But they will happily enforce this like a standing army. Now, back to Tara Ross. She says the federal farmer is worried about some of the powers vested in the federal government, especially the taxing power. And this is a big deal. He said she said external taxes, such as taxes on imposts, would not be so bad. So external taxes were one thing. But internal taxes were the big issue. Quote, they may fix themselves on every person and species of property in the community. They may be carried to any lengths and in proportion as they are extended. Numerous officers must be employed to assess them. Swarms of officers sounds familiar. Declaration of Independence and to enforce the collection of them. So expecting swarms of officers, taxes on virtually everything and using the power of government to collect them. These extensive taxing powers will, quote, soon defeat the operations of the state laws and governments. And if you think about what he's getting at here, this issue over internal versus external taxes, if you think about this in relationship to what the opposition to the British was, where resistance to taxation was primarily against the internal taxes, like the Stamp Act, rather than the external. In fact, Benjamin Franklin specifically told Parliament, like, look, OK, if you get rid of this Stamp Act, you, if you want to do some taxation, you got to have external taxes only. Internal taxes 
they're going to go absolutely nuts about. And they did. And so you can see how anti-federalists like the federal farmer saw the structure of the proposed Constitution as a betrayal of the entire principles of the American Revolution that led to the war for independence. This was a great deal. Of course, opposition was to centralize power, the Declaratory Act of 1766, which I've covered in a recent episode. But the outgrowth of that Declaratory Act, as John Hancock, Thomas Paine, and so many others told us, were the internal taxes that they were never authorized to do. So once they claimed unlimited centralized power, they implemented internal taxes, and that's where you got so much of the resistance. And so federal farmers just hammering home like, look, are you guys really doing this? This is insane. And he looks at he doesn't use those words. He says, when I recollect how lately Congress, conventions, legislatures and people contended in the cause of liberty and carefully weighed the importance of taxation, I can scarcely believe we are serious in proposing to vest the powers of laying and collecting internal taxes in a government so imperfectly organized for such purposes. So he's saying, look, wasn't this whole revolution we had over taxation without representation kind of thing? I mean, certainly that wasn't the root cause, but so many of us were opposed to that. And now we're going to do the same thing that we fought a long bloody war against to, to get away from? He said, I can scarcely believe we're trying to do this. This is nuts. He went further. He said, I am sensible also that it is said that Congress will not attempt to lay and collect internal taxes. And again, this is what Benjamin Franklin basically said when they passed the Declaratory Act. This was passed at the same time that they repealed the Stamp Act. It was the British claiming power over the colonies in all cases whatsoever. And he said, look, if you guys do this, everyone's going to be cool with it because they don't expect you to use it because you've had a similar uh, act against the Irish for many years and you don't really use it. And so, yeah, go for it. And then over time, they learned that they were going to use it. Benjamin Franklin changed his mind uh, by the mid-1770s. But here, federal farmers is really discussing the same kind of thing because the argument was, well, we got to give them this power. Sure, they won't really use it. Uh, so don't be too worried about it. And only good people are going to get in power. But he's saying, like, look... If you don't want them to use it, don't delegate the power in the first place. He said, I am sensible to that it is said that Congress will not attempt to lay and collect internal taxes, that it is necessary for them to have the power, though it cannot probably be exercised. I admit that it is not probable that any prudent Congress will attempt to lay and collect internal taxes, and especially direct taxes. But this only proves that the power would be improperly lodged in Congress and that it might be abused by imprudent and designing men. And of course, imprudent and designing men like Alexander Hamilton and the people who gave us, well, the whiskey tax, because it didn't take too long for the federal farmer to be both proved correct and incorrect. He, well, he said he wasn't expecting it. He, I don't expect it to happen, but an imprudent uh, Congress will go for this. So he expected it to happen. I think he may have been surprised to see how quickly they went down that route. Of course, the exact same route, well, that was part of the revolution. Back to T.J. Martinell. He warned in this third letter, uh, he said that, uh, where am I here? In his third letter on October 10, 1787, he warned that the new proposed powers in the federal government would bring about a, quote, tendency towards aristocracy similar to those which could be found in European nations. And he said the federal farmer was also equally suspicious of the executive's role. He was concerned about a mixture of powers. He wasn't happy with the judiciary. He wasn't happy with the executive, the Senate. We're going to get into all this stuff. He said, yet he thought the problem wasn't so much presidential authority but that his powers were tied too closely to the Senate, whose consent was needed for all sorts of presidential decisions. He said this, too, would tend toward aristocracy. What did he mean by aristocracy? Check this out. Federal Farmer writes, When we examine the powers of the president and the forms of the executive, we shall perceive that the general government in this part will have a strong tendency to aristocracy or the government of the few. Now, it didn't have to be hereditary aristocracy, but basically a, an elite, powerful few people that are controlling 
the fates and futures and the lives, liberty and property and prosperity of so many millions of people. He said the plan does not present a well-balanced government. The senatorial branch of the legislative and the executive are substantially united. And the president or the first executive magistrate may aid the senatorial in interest when weakest, but can never effectually support the Democratic, however it may be oppressed. So there was no real representation once again. He said, the excellency in my mind of a well-balanced government is that it consists of distinct branches. Each, and he thought each of the branches, the anti-federalists repeatedly said, you know, we all agree with the, the celebrated Montesquieu that you have to separate the legislative, executive and judicial branches. Uh, the argument, the debate over that was, did Montesquieu means you could kind of have them connected or did they have to be completely separated? The federalists said you could kind of mix them together and it was still OK. I think they were wrong on that. And the anti-federalists said you had to have them completely separated. So he was concerned about that as well. He said the, the well-balanced government means it is, consists of distinct branches, each sufficiently strong and independent to keep its own station and to aid either of the other branches, which may occasionally want aid. And basically, like he said in his first essay, where no matter how things look on paper, he felt that they were calculated to make one consolidated government over time. He again warned here in his third paper how he thought things would play out. He said, should the general government think it politics? So in other words, if it was politically palatable for people with power to do this, he said, as some administrations probably will. So he's expecting them all to do this. The government will take every occasion to multiply laws and officers to execute them, consider, considering these as so many necessary props for its own support. He said the internal sources of taxation must then be called into operation, and internal tax laws and federal assessors and collectors spread over this immense country. And that's a really good way of describing what we have today. Here's how T.J. Martinell sums it up. He said his overall assessment warning of an aristocracy, a government of the few, well, I mean, if you look at the more traditional definition of aristocracy, TJ hits on that as well. He said, one need only look up the estimated wealth of those who occupy power, how long they hold power, and how much power they wield to see how right he was. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational, more important than anything. I hope you learned something. Absolutely nothing helps us do this kind of work every single day, more, uh, more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can uh, join us for as little as two bucks a month. You got a couple of bucks of that dirty government fiat. Please throw it our way. TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash members. Uh, looks like there's a lot of back and forth in the chat here. I may have to, uh, well, I'm going to take a look at that a little bit later today. I had a couple of people write saying that there were a few people monopolizing the chat with some stuff that was totally off topic. So I'm going to take a closer look at that a little bit later today. Also see if there's some good uh, feedback. I get a lot of ideas for future episodes when you leave comments, whether it's live or in the archive. Sometimes it's sometimes it's a little off topic. Sometimes it's suggesting future things. Whatever it may be, I really appreciate your input. Uh, but I'll read through the chat and see if there's any comments or questions I can get back a little bit later today or tomorrow. Again, I hope you enjoyed the episode. 10th Amendment Center .com slash path to liberty is where you're going to find the blog post for this one in a couple of hours. And 10th Amendment Center .com slash members is where you can join us for as little as two bucks a month. We also have five year annual and lifetime options. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hope you're having a great Monday and I hope to see you next time here on the path to liberty.